I'm Jacob Courtright, and this is The Locker Room. Hello, everyone, and welcome into The Locker Room. Very excited to have you joining me today. Before we get started, as always, follow The Locker Room on Twitter, TLR with Jacob. On Facebook, The Locker Room host, Jacob. On Instagram, The Locker Room podcast, 615. And on TikTok, The Locker Room 22. This episode of The Locker Room is brought to you by FNX Fitness. Go to fnxfitness.com for all your fitness and supplement needs. That is fnxfit.com, fnxfit.com. Use the promo code TLRHOST, that is TLRHOST, all capitals, for 15% off your order. And now, as always, let's get into our Sunday show out or Monday makeovers. Well, what a weekend it was for not only the NFL, but college football. This was a great weekend if you are a football fan. And today we are going to start off with a team that not a lot of people are are used to hearing on the Sunday show outs or Monday makeovers. A team that not a lot of people are used to seeing in the winning column. A team that not a lot of people are used to rooting for. Until now, the Browns versus the Indianapolis Colts is the first game of my Sunday show out or Monday makeover. And we are going all the way here. Sunday show out for the Cleveland Browns. The Browns come in having to face the number one defense in the NFL in the Indianapolis Colts. And while the Colts got two takeaways on Baker Mayfield with two great interceptions, that all came way too late, and the Browns were able to surpass the Indianapolis Colts with a 32-23 to victory. Now, it did get interesting. Once the defense kind of settled in in the third quarter, that's when we saw the Indianapolis Colts push back against the Browns, and we saw the Browns get into some trouble. But the Browns have done a great job of closing out games thus far this year. Of course, against the Dallas Cowboys, they came, they, uh, came back against the Browns and almost won that game. If it wasn't for the Browns putting their foot on the gas and saying, no, we are not going to play conservative and give you more possessions. We are going to try and score. And that is what they did against the Cowboys and won. And that is what they did against the Indianapolis Colts. This was not a Monday makeover by any case by the Indianapolis Colts. They will be right on top of this division battling with Tennessee for the number one spot in the AFC South. So I'm not worried about Indianapolis. They had one too many mistakes. Phillip Rivers had two interceptions. One of them was egregious, and that was the the real turning point after they started making their comeback that really sealed the deal towards the end of the game. Phillip Rivers threw just a bad ball is what it was. They needed to get the running game more involved. Jonathan Taylor was having a decent day, but they went away from that because they dug themselves a hole in the first half. So we saw the Browns prevail once again and hold on to a lead, which is not, like I said, something we're used to seeing from the Browns. And the best way to really emphasize what this Browns team is doing well is time of possession by running the football efficiently. There was no Nick Chubb in this game, yet Kareem Hunt is right there to pick up the slack. They have an incredible duo in that backfield in Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt, and that is why they are winning games. Baker Mayfield's play is not the best. Two interceptions, he had a couple really bad throws. He got lit up by Justin Houston, and we did see him injure his ribs. I heard that he is going to play this coming Sunday, so no worries there for Browns fans. But the the control of the ground game is what is separating this Browns team apart from previous Browns teams. They've had a good array of players for the last three years. The problem is they weren't implementing the ground game properly and playing to Baker Mayfield's strengths. Now that they are, now that the new head coach is really giving them the tools to succeed, we are seeing a Browns team that I am going on record saying right now is going to make the playoffs. Next up on Sunday Show Out or Monday Makeover, we have got to go here because this team ended up firing their head coach and GM following this loss. The Atlanta Falcons versus the Carolina Panthers. Carolina comes out on top 23-16. to And like I said, Dan Quinn is no longer there. Their GM is no longer there. Atlanta being 0-5 is completely unacceptable. They are a Monday Makeover. 
Listen, these players have been fighting for Dan Quinn for years. We heard the same rumblings last year when they had a pitiful year that the players were begging to not fire Dan Quinn. We heard the players after the Super Bowl, after they gave up the biggest lead in NFL history and came all the, and the Patriots came all the way back and beat them. We heard the players advocating for Dan Quinn, don't fire him, don't fire him, we've got to be better, we've got to be better. Well, at some point, players, if you're not going to step up, they've got to make a change up top, and that is exactly what they did. The players did not step up. Atlanta has the personnel to score with anybody in the NFL. Atlanta has the personnel to outshoot anybody on any given Sunday. Don't get me wrong. Their defense is not great. They lost Vic Beasley in the offseason to the Tennessee Titans, uh, and he was kind of their only decent player left in that Atlanta defense. So their defense is not good, but their offense is pretty damn good. Julio Jones, though, has to stay healthy. Calvin Ridley has to stay healthy. Todd Gurley has got to be better. Now, he did have a great Sunday with 14 carries, 121 yards, and a touchdown, and that was simply for for the fact that Carolina's run defense is not that good right now. Um... So we saw Todd Gurley have a bounce back game and be better, but Todd Gurley's got to be more consistent. He can't go for 54 yards and one touchdown two Sundays ago to now 121 and one touchdown this Sunday. So he's got to find some consistency in the 85 to 90 yard range and a touchdown a game. Matt Ryan's got to be more consistent, uh, but I'm not going to fully put this on him because he has no wide receivers to throw to when all of them are out for injuries. Julio Jones has sat out more games than he's played in the last two seasons. Calvin Ridley, always hurt. After they have big showing outs, they always get hurt the following week, and the problem is Matt Ryan has no consistency. And now a lot of people are seeing what Carson Wentz has to deal with in Atlanta is the same thing that Carson Wentz deals with in Philadelphia. I mean, we laugh, but do we even know the names of the wide receivers besides Zach Ertz that Carson Wentz has been throwing to? No, we don't. A no-name guy has caught a touchdown the last two Sundays for them. So the same thing with Atlanta. When you have Julio and Calvin out all the time, uh, and even though Calvin Ridley played and had a good game, eight receptions, 136 yards, Calvin can't miss one game and then play and have a great game. That's where the consistency has to build. They've got to stay healthy on the wide receiver side of the football because when they are, they have one of the most dynamic wide receiving cores in the NFL. They have a quarterback that can be a top 10 guy. But like I said, this comes down to Dan Quinn. You have got to get this thing done. You've had opportunities to win games. You have you have opportunities to be uh, three and two right now easily. You've had those opportunities. You've squandered those opportunities by poor coaching. Uh, Your defense has got to be better all around a Monday makeover. This next game is the game of the Sunday, and there's no other game I could have put here. Absolutely no way. The Las Vegas Raiders beat the defending Super Bowl champs, Kansas City Chiefs, in a 40-32 to win. Not only was it a show out by the quarterbacks themselves putting up big numbers, Patrick Mahomes, 340 yards, two touchdowns, and an INT. That was very late in the game. And then, of course, Derek Carr, 347, three touchdowns, and one interception as well. This was the first quarterback that the Kansas City Chiefs have, have allowed over 300 yards in the last two seasons. So if that tells you anything about this Kansas City defense is they don't give up a whole lot of passing yards. And Derek Carr was able to shred them on Sunday. Josh Jacobs had a pretty decent game, 77 yards and two touchdowns. Henry Ruggs was the absolute man himself, 118 yards and a touchdown on only two receptions. Travis Kelsey was great as well, of course, eight receptions, 108 yards and a touchdown. But this came down to a Sunday show out for the Las Vegas Raiders. It takes a lot of guts for a team to go into Arrowhead Stadium and win a game. And it was simply off of the play and the push, the pushing of Derek Carr, not only pushing his teammates, but pushing his coaches. We saw Derek Carr in a heated conversation with several of his coaches saying, we've got to get the over-the-top routes, we've got to give the deep balls, we've got to stop going safe and going short. And that's what a lot of coaches do, especially when they play a great team like Kansas City, is they want to maintain time of possession, they want to maintain the football by running it and slowly dragging this thing out to a 21-14 to victory and not giving Kansas City the chance to score a whole bunch of points. 
Well, Derek Carr came over to the sidelines and in a very interesting interview afterwards basically said, we've got to duel with these guys. We can't continue to grind this thing out. They're not letting Jacobs get a bunch of yards on the ground. So let me throw over the top. And that is when we saw out of that break, we saw Henry Ruggs go for a deep touchdown uh, I think it was like a 75-yard touchdown. So we saw Henry Henry Ruggs have the burning play immediately following Derek Carr getting into his coaching staff and saying, hey, let's open this thing up. And from there on, Derek Carr was able to open up this game, and he hurt them simply with his arm. It wasn't the running game that a lot of people thought was going to stifle this Kansas City team because their run defense, although it's good, it is not great, and everybody expected Josh Jacobs to have a 200-yard game. It was Derek Carr going to his coaches and opening this thing up with his arm. 347 yards. I mean, that is a massive amount of yards considering Kansas City, like I said, only allows 280 yards to quarterbacks. That is their average. So they have not had a quarterback go over 300 in two seasons. So that was an incredible performance. There's not enough great things I can say. I'm not worried about Kansas City. This isn't a Monday makeover or things that they did wrong. They simply got outplayed by a a team that played better. I mean, Las Vegas is not a better team, but they played better. Derek Carr was the actual uh, MVP of that game. He he put that team on his back and out-dueled the very best dueler in Patrick Mahomes. This was a Sunday show out all the way. Well, I know this might start getting repetitive, but we are going to have another Sunday show out in this next matchup. The Pittsburgh Steelers against the Philadelphia Eagles. Philadelphia is playing extremely desperate. And I thought they had a pretty decent game. Carson Wentz, of course, another two interception day. They lose 29-38. to the, the, the simple fact is, of course... Philadelphia is a Monday makeover. They have a lot of problems at the quarterback position. They have a lot of problems on the wide receiving core, not staying healthy. Their defense has a lot of wide open holes. Darius Slay, who they paid a whole lot of money for, is not living up to expectations. But this was more so about Ben Roethlisberger and the Pittsburgh Steelers. Roethlisberger goes for 240 yards and three touchdowns. And you guessed it, all three touchdowns went to the same person. The rookie, Chase Claypool, had the game of his life. Not only is he the player of the week for me, but he was my very reason I picked Sunday show out. They were able to torch, and I really mean torch, this team uh, through the air. The running game didn't really have to be existent at all. Only had 100, I think, combined yards on the ground. It was simply the fact that Chase Claypool was not going to be denied. Listen, the Pittsburgh Steelers have a top 10 defense in this league, and now that Big Ben has come back healthy, Big Ben has come back and been assertive, Big Ben has come back and been efficient, Big Ben has come back and not made the dumb throws that he used to make in his younger career, now that we have a more solidified Big Ben who has a healthy arm and elbow and shoulder for once, we are now seeing a Pittsburgh Steelers team that could make a push to the Super Bowl. They will not be denied if they continually play like this. The Pittsburgh Steelers are 4-0. and Sunday show out for the Pittsburgh Steelers. What a game. And if I'm in that division, I am worried that the Pittsburgh Steelers are there to sneak in to the Super Bowl. All right, well, I got a few more here for you. Let's go into my next Sunday show at Monday Makeover. I'm going to go Monday Makeover for the San Francisco 49ers. They lost to the <laughs> They lost to the Miami Dolphins 43 to 7. And while I do want to go Sunday show out here because the Dolphins did have such a great day, this was more so about what San Francisco cannot do. And that's find a consistent quarterback. We saw Jimmy Garoppolo finally come back into the into the uh, starting quarterback position, and he had an atrocious day. Two interceptions before he was benched by C.J. Beathard. Beathard came in and was pretty efficient, 9 of 18, 100 yards, and one touchdown, actually 94 yards and a touchdown. I think C.J. might be the starting quarterback going forward. They play better with him. He knows how to get George Kittle involved. He knows how to involve the running backs in a way where they are efficient, and that is what you have to have in San Francisco. The problem I have with Jimmy Garoppolo is Jimmy Garoppolo is always wanting to push the ball deep. He's always wanting to make the big, fantastic play. If he would utilize the weapons that he has, the San Francisco team would be right back on track to make it back to the Super Bowl. 
When you have George Kittle, and when C.J. Beathard plays quarterback, George Kittle goes for eight catches, 130 yards, and a, and a touchdown. And then when when Jimmy G comes in here, Jimmy G throws him one ball for 12 yards in the first in the first uh, half that he played. That's a big problem. You are not utilizing the best tight end in football. Raheem Mostert finally returned to the starting lineup. He had 11 carries with 90 yards. He is an efficient running back. Uh, but the problem is, is when you're down 25 points, you can't continually use your weapons. George Kittle, uh, Raheem Mostert, uh, McKinnon has come in and played very nice. When you have players like that, you are a time of possession. Take your time because you're going to get George Kittle every third down wide open. You're going to continually move the sticks and you're going to be able to put up points with the best of them while maintaining time of possession. This was definitely a Monday makeover for the San Francisco 49ers. What they are doing, they look pitiful. Their coaching staff looks like they have no idea what to do. If C.J. Beathard plays, I think that they are a much better team. Jimmy G is going to have to either be a whole lot better because he's the reason they lost the Super Bowl, or they're going to have to just swallow their pride and start C.J. Beathard from here on out. Because uh, it's, this thing is just not working with Jimmy G. I will give a shout out to Fitz Magic just real quick for those of you at home who are going to be mad. Uh, Three hundred and <laughs> I was looking at my notes. Three hundred and fifty yards and three touchdowns for Ryan Fitz Magic. We know he always has games like this, and they always come at unexpected times. What a day for him! But this is more so, like I said, about the San Francisco 49ers. They lost in the Super Bowl last year. I don't think that they are going to get back to the Super Bowl this year, especially when Seattle is playing the way that they are. This is going to be a tough year for San Francisco if they can't figure out the quarterback position. Big Monday makeover here. Last but not least, we have got to go to this game as well. The Minnesota Vikings lose in stunning fashion, 26 to 27 to the Seattle Seahawks. This is not a Monday makeover for the Minnesota Vikings. They are playing desperate. They are playing good football. The problem is they just went up against a better team and a better quarterback, and that is Russell Wilson, the MVP so far of this entire year. He didn't have that big of a day. He did have three touchdown tosses and an interception and only 217 yards. But the problem is is that he threw a ball to DK Metcalf to seal the deal and break the hearts of Minnesota Vikings fans everywhere you go. Uh, This was more so a Sunday show out simply for the fact that Russell Wilson took the game over when he needed to. He had a touchdown throw earlier to DK Metcalf on the same drive that was dropped. That would have been a game-ending drive as well. But DK Metcalf comes back. He uh, apologizes to Russell Wilson by making it up to him and catching the final ball for the touchdown. This team is playing lights out right now. Their defense is playing decent, and that is all they can ask for. Because this defense I don't think is very good. There's a lot of practice players. There's a lot of of uh, young talent that I don't think is good enough to be with the big one, the big dogs in this league right now. But they are doing it simply off of the back of Russell Wilson. This defense is playing inspired football. This offense is playing like they always play every single year when they're healthy. They're playing great football behind a great quarterback and arguably the second best quarterback in the NFL right now. By the way that Lamar has been playing, I think Russell Wilson right now is the second best quarterback. I still put him behind Patrick Mahomes simply because Mahomes is just doing insane amount of numbers every Sunday. But this is simply a Sunday show up because these Seattle Seahawks are on their way to a Super Bowl. Especially with the, the division struggling the way it is, Russell Wilson is really moving this franchise forward. Pete Carroll looks like he's coaching inspired football right now. They're playing desperate. They're playing hungry. They're playing like they need every single game at the beginning because they know they have a very hard schedule the further they go along in the year. And they can't be fighting for 8-8 eight and eight in this division because that is not going to do it. So Seattle, Sunday. Sunday show out way to seal the deal well there are your Sunday show outs and Monday makeovers we are not going to do players of the week this week because we are going to go to a little bit of NFL news let's start off with this Dak Prescott is done for the season Uh, for those of you who watched the game or watched the replay of his injury I know a lot of it's been blurred out now you can YouTube his his uh, live injury and see it it was disgusting it was uh it was hard to watch especially for me because I have a weak stomach but I feel horrible for Dak Prescott 
this uh, uh, this is no strike at Dak Prescott here because I'm, I'm everybody knows I'm not a huge Dallas Cowboys fan. I don't have a lot of people that that listen to me that are huge Dallas Cowboys fans, and this is not a knock on Dak Prescott. But the kind of football that I saw them play with Andy Dalton was inspired football, and they came back and won a game that they should have lost. Uh, and I know that a lot of the emotions are, were running high because of Dak Prescott's injury. We saw Zeke bust for a touchdown and then flash the number four into the camera shortly after Dak was rushed to the hospital for emergency surgery. But Andy Dalton brings a sense of urgency to this Cowboys team that Dak Prescott does not. Andy Dalton's going to come out firing from the gates. He's not going to wait for them to get down three touchdowns before he decides to play. And like I said, this is not a knock against Dak Prescott. Of course, we all feel horrible for him and wish him a speedy recovery and to get back to the NFL. Trust me, I had him on fantasy, and the amount of points this man was putting up on Sundays was was laughable. But Andy Dalton is not a bad replacement for Dak Prescott. He is an experienced quarterback in the NFL. He's got a decent arm. He has starting experience starting every single season for the I mean, it was the Cincinnati Bengals, but he was still a starting quarterback in this league. And he had some decent uh, 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 wins against big opponents. So we saw him uh, come back, and and with a not-so-good Cincinnati Bengals team, he made some noise. He is going to fit in just nicely with the Dallas Cowboys. And if you're a Cowboys fan, I wouldn't be as discouraged as I as as you should be. I know you lost your franchise quarterback, or at least he was playing on the franchise tag, but you have a guy in Andy Dalton that can get the job done. And I think this is what propels this team to not only win this division, but I think we're going to see Dallas go on a nice little win streak here behind the arm of Andy Dalton. Uh, Dak Prescott, we wish you nothing but the, the fastest and speediest recovery and that you can come back and continue uh, your football career. The next NFL news I want to talk about, and this is a beautiful story and a poetic start to hopefully a, a, a great finish to his career. Mr. Alex Smith came back into the game on Sunday for the first time since his atrocious leg injury. 17 surgeries later, he was able to step back out onto a football field. He was able to deliver some complete passes. He looked a little uncomfortable. He looked a little nervous, and you saw his wife and his kids in the stands really just holding their breath, praying that their father and her husband doesn't get even more hurt. But uh, he was able to come out there and not only inspire Uh, his football team, and I understood they lost, and they played a Rams team that is very, very good right now, but just the fact that he came back onto the field, he, for me, is the comeback player of the year. I don't care if he plays another down the rest of the year. I don't care if Alex Smith throws 30 interceptions. The fact that he was able to step foot onto that football field was an inspiration in and of itself. Now, we saw Dwayne Haskins wasn't even with the team, and that's a whole other issue that we're going to discuss on our later date. I thought Kyle Allen was playing pretty good football before he got hurt. He did have a nice rushing touchdown at the very beginning of the game. Uh, But this is more so about the return of Alex Smith. I am uh, happy for you. I'm happy that you are back out there, and I really hope we see Alex Smith play good football. Because uh, uh, any player, especially this is the same thing that I said about Teddy Bridgewater, any player that suffers a gruesome injury, the fact that you're able to come back out there and and not only uh, mentally check into a football game, but physically be out there as well is is truly an inspiration. So I just wanted to give a shout-out in our NFL News segment to Alex Alex Smith on Comeback Player of the Year. And the last thing I want to talk about when it comes to my NFL news segment this week, Justin Herbert was not only named the starting quarterback by his head coach, but Justin Herbert is going to be a star in this league. He had 264 yards and four touchdowns in an OT loss. I do realize that it was a loss, but 27-30 to to the New Orleans Saints, which a lot of people have the Saints, of course, every year going into the playoffs and going deep into the playoffs. But Justin Herbert is out there to outduel one of the best to ever do it in Drew Brees, and uh, he did. Even though Drew Brees had more yards, 325 yards, one touchdown, one interception, Justin Herbert's four touchdown passes were key, 264 yards, no interceptions. I commend Anthony Lynn on making a very tough decision. 
he came out in an interview earlier this week when he named Justin Herbert the starting quarterback from here on out. He literally said that he was breathtaking away by what he has seen so far and that while he has a lot to work on and he has a lot of room to grow, Tyrod Taylor is simply not going to be the answer for them going forward. And that's a gutsy decision, especially when you have a veteran like Tyrod Taylor that uh, is very capable of leading this team to one and four. But (laughs) he put Justin Herbert out there simply for the fact that Justin Herbert is is taking people's breasts away with the amount of throws that he is making, the big arm that he has, his size, his footwork, uh, his movement in and out of the pocket. We saw him deliver strikes while getting destroyed uh, by by linemen, cornerbacks, uh, linebackers, whoever wanted to blitz and hit Justin Herbert, it seemed like they did because this Chargers line is not that great. But Justin Herbert was still delivering dimes. Now we have yet to see Tua Tungavailoa down in Miami, and we have seen Joe Burrow be who Joe Burrow is, which is a, a, a very good quarterback. But I'm going to go on record saying right now, Justin Herbert is going to be the best quarterback out of this draft. While Joe Burrow is going to be a nice quarterback for years to come, he's always going to be solid. He's never going to be spectacular. Justin Herbert has that that spectacular factor where he has the arm, the size, the speed, the speed, the, the 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 mobility of, of a great quarterback. He reminds me a lot of an Aaron Rodgers with his arm strength. He reminds me a lot of Patrick Mahomes and his footwork. Now, I'm not saying he's going to be as good as they are, but Justin Herbert, they, they found a stud in this guy, and that is why so many people were raving about him in the draft. Justin Herbert, I wanted to give him a shout-in on our NFL news segment this week because Justin Herbert is showing up to the NFL. So congrats to Justin Herbert. Well, there is our NFL segment of the week. I hope you enjoyed it. Like I said, always comment. Let me know what you think. Always hit me up. I'd love to answer questions and talk to you about whatever it is. It's always a a joy to answer fans' questions. All right, let's get into, and I know you all know it's coming because I did my live video. You've seen my Instagram, uh, the Los Angeles Lakers, what this championship has not only meant to this organization, not only what this championship means uh, in the legacy of LeBron, not only what this championship means to the city Uh, of Los Angeles, but what this championship uh, uh, probability was, what this championship difficulty was, we're going to get into all the nitty-gritty details that you want to hear about. And no, I'm not going to go Jordan and LeBron today. That is a future segment for a whole podcast coming up soon. I know I've already done one. If you're interested on why I think LeBron is the GOAT, go back into my podcast and look for my Jordan versus LeBron uh, that is in there. It's about an hour long. But we are going to do another Jordan versus LeBron. Uh, I saw Nick Wright earlier today make incredible arguments for why LeBron is the GOAT. I, of course, think so as well. So let's sum up this NBA season. Final seconds here in this NBA season. The respect from those two. And that's it. It's over. This historic 2020 NBA championship belongs to the Los Angeles Lakers. The Lakers conquer the bubble and banner number 17 will soon hang in the rafters. We just want our respect. Rob wants his respect. <laughs> Coach Vogel wants his respect. Our organization wants their respect. Laker Nation wants their respect. And I want my damn respect, too. <laughs> so in the words of Kobe Bryant, Mamba out. But in the words of us, Not forgotten. Live on, brother. Well, there are your your final ribbon ribbon on top of the present. Uh, uh, Not only phrases, but sayings to to sum up this whole NBA season. Of course, we opened up with the Los Angeles Lakers winning the 2020 NBA Finals. Uh, very excited about that. Uh, I'm stoked. For those of you who don't know how stoked I am, go to my Instagram. Uh, then we went to LeBron James demanding not only that he gets respect, but that the organization of the Lakers gets respect once again. And then we end on the beautiful words of LeBron James uh, saying, Mamba out, but never forgotten. And that is what's kind of stuck in my head this entire NBA Finals, this entire season, this entire uh, Lakers year was for Kobe, was for Gigi, and that is kind of, I just kind of want to sum up this championship. Let's start first off with the difficulty of this championship, and then we'll end on a much sweeter note with Kobe Bryant and and Gigi in remembrance of them. 
Uh, this is one of the hardest NBA championships, if not the hardest one, to ever be won by anybody from the beginning of the NBA until now. So I think one of the biggest reasons we can talk about this being the most difficult probably in NBA history was the mental taxation on the players, on the organizations, on the teams. Uh, we heard not only from from Paul George, which he was a big proponent of the mental uh, toughness of this and how a lot of these players were depressed, but we saw uh, we saw Sweet Lou have to dip out of the NBA bubble. We saw Giannis Antetokounmpo, who a lot of people would never even guess being mentally weak, uh, we saw him speak out on this issue. We saw every notable player all the way down from uh, from Sweet Lou to Kawhi Leonard to LeBron James to Anthony Davis to Paul George to, uh, to Giannis to Jimmy Butler. We saw all of these teams not only uh, physically be taxed by having to play uh, back uh, every other night now as opposed to every three but having to mentally endure the toughest situation of their entire lives. The, uh, uh, a couple trained Navy SEALs came on and talked about uh, this on TNT, saying how this is basically torture for guys like this. this now, for anybody else, for, for an average Joe, having to go stay on Disney's property for 90 days doesn't seem all that bad. Getting to play golf, you know, basically eat whatever you want that's there. You get to uh, swim. You get to go to the water parks. You get to uh, basically do whatever you want, and then at night you go play some ball. For the average guy like us, that is great. But for these players who have had a lifestyle of freedom, who have had a lifestyle of luxury, who have had a lifestyle of being able to do whatever they want post-game, pre-game, uh, besides, you know, having to arrive as, at a certain time, this is extremely difficult. And if you put any team in any era, they would struggle. Imagine, uh, you know, Americans were complaining about being locked in our house, and that is, you know, all well and fine. But imagine being told, hey, you can't leave for 90 days, and your only motivating factor to stay there is playing basketball. That's all. That's the toughest mental a push through that anybody would ever have to take on in order to win a championship. So you're asking these players to not only stay for 90 days, but you're asking these players to now play instead of there's no travel now. So instead of playing on a Monday and then reconvening on a Thursday, they're now playing Monday, Wednesday, Wednesday, Friday, Friday, Sunday, or uh, yeah, Friday, Sunday. So they're now playing every other day, which is not what they're used to as well. That's a lot harder, especially in the NBA playoffs where you're having to play full out every single night. Otherwise, you're in trouble. Uh, we saw that with the Los Angeles Clippers, thinking that they could they could you know ease on by, and then they eventually got knocked out by the Denver Nuggets. So in the NFL, let's think about this: they get a playoff game, and it's hard, it's brutal, it's you know it's it's a it's a battle. But then they get a full week, sometimes even two weeks before they even have to play again. So the NBA is now having to play every other night, which is a tough uh, a tough assignment for these players. Most players in the NBA are sitting out back-to-backs during the regular season, and now they're having to play every other night as hard as they can every single time uh, because everything's on the line every single game. So not only was it mentally the hardest taxing uh, thing that anybody's ever had to go through when it comes to the NBA, but uh, physically it's one of the most daunting tasks that has ever happened as well. Having to play so close together, no travel. And a lot of people say, you know, travel helps, uh, not having to travel helps a lot of these players. No, because it also hurt everybody that was a number one seed via the Los Angeles Lakers and the Bucks. They had no advantage going into these playoffs. Another reason this is one of the most difficult championships ever won. You work all season to get the number one seed, and what do you get for it? You get your logo projected on the floor. You don't get anything. So now you don't get home court advantage. You don't get your... um your audience there. You don't get, you know, a hundred thousand screaming at Staples Center. So now you've battled all year long for absolutely no uh, advantage in the playoffs. Another reason that this is so hard and so mentally taxing. You heard a lot of these players talk about how awkward it was, how hard it was to play with no fans cheering them on, or even the piped in crowd noise they said was so uh, was so difficult to accept as real noise that a lot of these players said that it was completely useless. So you have that challenge as well. That is why this is the most challenging championship I think ever 
one. There's the mental aspect. There's the physical aspect. There's the no fans aspect. There's the, the confinement aspect. And I know to a lot of us, if we had to go basically on a Disney resort for 90 days, we wouldn't be complaining. But you have to understand, these guys are used to their chefs, their trainers, their doctors, their time away, their regimens after games, before games. Now they're getting all that stripped away, and they simply it comes down to who is the best basketball team, who's the most mentally checked in who's the most physically healthy and capable and that came down to the Los Angeles Lakers winning the 2020 NBA championship so to congrats uh, to LA for winning the hardest championship in NBA history now let's go to the second sound clip that I put in there LeBron's acceptance speech of not only winning the finals MVP and we'll talk about why that was deserved but LeBron James demanding his respect and demanding that the Los Angeles Lakers finally get their respect again as well Now, we're going to talk about a whole lot more coming up in the upcoming episodes about more detailed on LeBron, more detailed on the Los Angeles Lakers, more detailed on what this championship means. But let's talk about what he said in his acceptance speech of the finals MVP. Was it deserved? First off, absolutely it was. LeBron James triple-double to finish out game six. He had 28, 14, and 10. He had 40 the game prior to that. He led this team in every category Uh, Of course, assists, rebounds, scoring. He did it all over AD. There is no player in NBA history who won finals MVP after putting up a 15-point performance uh, in a loss. That has never happened. It never will happen in the NBA finals. So for those of you who want to say AD got robbed, you're full of crap. I'm just going to be blunt as I possibly can. You are full of crap. You are just a LeBron hater. You don't actually know what you're talking about. And I know that seems a little harsh, but I'm tired of seeing the same bullcrap narrative that LeBron never gets the respect that he deserves. And he deserved the finals MVP. He led his team in every category. He led his team all year long. He led his team in the moments that it mattered. He started out that game by playing hard defense. He started out by scoring six early points that were needed. He started out the game by assisting the ball when it was needed. So you tell me, the, the, the listener that decides that AD got robbed, you tell me how LeBron James is not the finals MVP leading in every category besides blocks. Tell me how LeBron averages 27, 10, and 9. Almost averages a triple-double, and then we want to hate on this man because he's not being as great as we've seen before. Let's just put it this way. In year 17, LeBron is just as good as he was in year 2013, and that was probably the greatest LeBron we have ever seen in year in, in 2013 in that championship. That is the best defensive LeBron, the best offensive LeBron, the most explosive LeBron we've ever seen. In year 17, he's arguably even better than that because he's the smartest player that has ever walked this earth when it comes to basketball. So he leads his team not only not only physically did he lead his team on the court, but mentally. Every single guy on that roster, including Anthony Davis, said mentally LeBron James was the sole reason that they were mentally checked in, that they were mentally ready to go every single night, that they mentally were able to push through and win this championship. So finals MVP is somebody that is not only a leader, somebody that really pushes his guys to be better, but is also somebody that numbers-wise is the best player on the court, and that was LeBron James. James. There's no argument for Anthony Davis. If Anthony Davis did what he did in games one and two the entire series, this is a runaway Anthony Davis finals MVP. But he didn't. That is the problem. Game three coming up with 15, having an average 22 point game the game following that, even though it was a Lakers win, it was not a great outing for Anthony Davis. Then, of course, we saw him have a pretty good game in the finals, but if we're being honest, they were front running the entire time. LeBron James is 28 points. I will even say his triple double there was more so for the stats than it was for the actual need needed uh, needed uh, neededness of that. If that's the word, uh, a necessity. That's what I was looking for. The necessity of that because they steamrolled the, the the Miami Heat in the biggest slaughter of an NBA Finals game we have ever seen. This was this was bigger than the massacre that happened in the 70s. This was the biggest finals slaughter in history. It was a 32-point game at one point. The Lakers literally could have gone into the locker room and let the Miami Heat have wide open lanes the entire rest of the game, and they still would have lost. So back to the MVP. Does LeBron deserve respect? Absolutely. For those of you who don't want to respect what this man is doing, we laugh at his numbers saying that they're just okay when he's averaging 28 
10 and 9 in an NBA Finals. In the NBA playoffs, he's averaging almost a triple double in year 17. LeBron has never gotten the respect that he deserves. LeBron continually, continually is the most hated athlete on all of not only social media, but by every sports uh, broadcaster out there, besides a few. Uh, so LeBron not only never gets his respect from the media, but he never gets his respect from the from the people out there that want to continually just bash everything that he does. Like he said in his tweet yesterday, he came out and said, you know, I've accomplished uh, more than basically anybody ever will, but they'll still find some new narrative or some new way that I have to do something. And like LeBron said, there's always something. Beside, no one can just tip their hats off and go, wow, LeBron. Great job. Wow, LeBron, you led this team. Wow, wow, wow. They have to find some other new avenue. Well, Jordan, blah, blah, blah. Well, this, blah, blah, blah. Well, that, blah, blah, blah. So finally, give LeBron his damn respect. I've been respecting this man since the beginning. And you that that are the hater, you that are the absolute, I can't stand LeBron James, guess what? This is not a personality contest. This isn't about who likes LeBron and who doesn't. This is about his game. And that is all he's asked for is respect his damn game. You don't have to respect him as a person, what he believes in, what he fights for, but you have to respect his game if you are a true sports, not only fan, but a sports uh, 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 guru, uh, uh, someone who considers themselves well-versed in sports, you at some point... In order to have validity in your life, you are going to have to come to the realization that LeBron James is one of the greatest ever. If you don't believe he's the GOAT, I believe he's the GOAT, and we'll argue about that later. But you have to come to the realization of that. You can't continually say he's not even in the top five. You know, people like uh, Paul Pierce are saying stuff like that. So give this man the respect that he deserves. Give the Los Angeles Lakers the respect that they deserve as well, because they are now the greatest franchise in sports history. Even though the Boston Celtics had 17 coming in, the Lakers tied the Boston Celtics, so technically the Celtics have been in the ahead all this time. Now they are tied. What the Celtics did though winning those earlier championships was back when basketball was not what it is today. The Lakers did a lot of it post uh you know, post the three-point line, a lot of it damage was done in the 90s. Uh, of course, Magic Johnson uh, uh, earlier than that, balling out. So the Los Angeles Lakers deserve their respect because they are the greatest basketball sports franchise in history. Done deal. It's not the Boston Celtics. It is now the Los Angeles Lakers. Rob Polinka deserves his respect for putting this team together. This team with any other superstar plugged in place of LeBron James is not a championship team. LeBron James is literally what made this team. And Rob Polinka filled pieces around LeBron that made this team what it was so everybody deserves the respect Gina uh or not Gina um the Lakers owner she deserves her respect Jeannie Buss she deserves her respect not only being the first woman owner to ever win a championship but for allowing this team to be put together and allowing Rob to do his job in order to put this team together so everybody deserves respect I 100% agree with what LeBron said give him give everybody else their damn respect And last but not least, that last clip you heard was LeBron James talking at the Lakers' first game since Kobe Bryant's death. And and this is just where, uh, you know, love LeBron, hate LeBron. This is where we just have to enjoy the beauty of of what happened. Kobe Bryant and the Los Angeles Lakers were one in the same. I do understand that there was great players before Kareem, Magic, uh, Shaquille, but Kobe Bryant was it, it was making the the Lakers front office better. He was pushing them to be better. He was meeting with Jeannie Buss, telling her how to get LeBron. Kobe Bryant was in and of himself what the Lakers, the Laker Nation, was about, and uh, he he truly was a, a good father. He was a good role model for that organization. You could see Kobe starting to finally get involved in that front office and make his presence known and really impact uh, that organization after his playing career. And um, what this championship meant was was just a beautiful, beautiful bow on top of the biggest present, which was the Los Angeles Lakers did it. They, they finished it out, and even though a championship is never going to bring back the, live of Co- the lives of Kobe Bryant and Gigi Bryant and everybody else that was lost in that crash, it is a beautiful way to kind of let Kobe know, hey, this one's for you, man. This championship was won for Kobe Bryant, was won for Gigi Bryant, was won for the Bryant family. Uh, this was a, a storybook ending. I, I can guarantee you in LeBron James's documentary, 
in 20 years, we're going to get a beautiful poetic, poetic story of how LeBron and these Lakers persevere not only through everything they've gone through this season, but how Kobe Bryant and his spirit drove this team. Every huddle was broken with Mamba on three. They had the black Mamba jerseys. Every player after winning the championship continually said, Kobe, this one, this one was for you. We were doing it for Kobe. From AD to LeBron James to Markeith Morris to Frank Vogel, this one was for Kobe. This one was for Gigi. And like I said, there's no way they can be brought back with words. There's no way they can be brought back with a championship. But this is just a beautiful ending to a storybook season to a historic franchise to one of their greatest players of all time in Kobe Bryant. So in the words of not only LeBron James in that speech, but of the great late Kobe Bryant, one of the greatest basketball players we've ever seen. Mamba out, but never forgotten. I want to thank you all for joining me on this episode of The Locker Room. We have a ton of more LeBron James, Michael Jordan, all that stuff coming up, so be ready. We'll get get a little bit more excited, get a little bit more detailed on this NBA Finals, on this championship. I hope you join us next Tuesday. Make sure you're staying up to date with everything The Locker Room. We have a Titans take dropping tomorrow morning after the Titans play the Buffalo Bills tonight. So got a lot going on. Make sure you're staying with us on all of our social media. Love you, Locker Room Faithful, and I will see you next Tuesday. I'm Jacob Courtright, and this is The Locker Room.